The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 2, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 9, Side 1. Now when all this happened, says Marco Polo, Messer Polo was on the spot. He became fairly intimate with the Khan and describes his amusements in fond detail. Besides four wives called empresses, the Khan had many concubines, recruited from Ungut in Tartary, whose ladies seemed especially fair to the royal eye. Every second year, says Marco, officers of proved discrimination were sent to this region to enlist for His Majesty's service a hundred young women, according to specifications carefully laid down by the king. Upon their arrival in his presence, he causes a new examination to be made by a different set of inspectors, and from amongst them a further selection takes place, when thirty or forty are retained for his own chamber. These are committed separately to the care of certain elderly ladies of the palace, whose duty it is to observe them attentively during the course of the night, in order to ascertain that they have not any concealed imperfections, that they sleep tranquilly, do not snore, have sweet breath, and are free from unpleasant scent in any part of the body. Having undergone this rigorous scrutiny, they are divided into parties of five, each taking turn for three days and three nights in His Majesty's interior apartment, where they are to perform every service that is required of them, and he does with them as he likes. When this term is completed, they are relieved by another party, and in this manner successively, until the whole number have taken their turn, when the first five recommence their attendance. After remaining in China for twenty years, Marco Polo, with his father and his uncle, took advantage of an embassy sent by the Khan to Persia, to return to their native city with a minimum of danger and expense. Kublai gave them a message to the Pope, and fitted them out with every comfort then known to travelers. The voyage around the Malay Peninsula to India and Persia, the overland journey to Trebizond on the Black Sea, and the final voyage to Venice took them three years. And when they reached Europe they learned that both the Khan and the Pope were dead. Kublai Khan had proved his conversion to civilization by developing gout. Marco himself, with characteristic obstinacy, lived to the age of seventy. On his deathbed his friends pleaded with him for the salvation of his soul to retract the obviously dishonest statements that he had made in his book. But he answered stoutly, I have not told half of what I saw. Soon after his death a new comic figure became popular at the Venetian carnivals. He was dressed like a clown and amused the populace by his gross exaggerations. His name was Marco Millions. 2. The Ming and the Qing Fall of the Mongols, the Ming Dynasty, the Manchu Invasion, the Qing Dynasty, an enlightened monarch, Qian Lung rejects the Occident. Not for four centuries was China to know again so brilliant an age. The Yuan Dynasty quickly declined, for it was weakened by the collapse of the Mongol power in Europe and Western Asia, and by the signification, if so pedantic a convenience may be permitted for so repeated a phenomenon, of the Mongols in China itself. Only in an era of railroads, telegraph, and print could so vast and artificial an empire, so divided by mountains, deserts, and seas, be held permanently under one rule. The Mongols proved better warriors than administrators, and the successors of Kublai were forced to restore the examination system and to utilize Chinese capacity in government. The conquest produced in the end little change in native customs or ideas, except that it introduced perhaps such new forms as the novel and the drama into Chinese literature. Once more the Chinese married their conquerors, civilized them, and overthrew them. In 1368 an ex-Buddhist priest led a revolt, entered Peking in triumph, and proclaimed himself the first emperor of the Ming, or brilliant, dynasty. In the next generation an able monarch came to the throne, and under Yung Lo China again enjoyed prosperity and contributed to the arts. Nevertheless the brilliant dynasty ended in a chaos of rebellion and invasion. At the very time when the country was divided into hostile factions, a new horde of conquerors poured through the Great Wall and laid siege to Peking. The Manchus were a Tunguzic people who had lived for many centuries in what is now Manchu Kuo, that is, the kingdom of the Manchus. Having extended their power northward to the Amur River, they turned back southward and marched upon the Chinese capital. The last Ming emperor gathered his family about him, drank a toast to them, bade his wife kill herself, and then hanged himself with his girdle after writing his last edict upon the lapel of his robe. We, for in virtue and of contemptible personality, have incurred the wrath of God on high. 
My ministers have deceived me. I am ashamed to meet my ancestors. Therefore I myself take off my crown, and with my hair covering my face await dismemberment at the hands of the rebels. Do not hurt a single one of my people. The Manchus buried him with honor and established the Qing, or unsullied dynasty, that was to rule China until our own revolutionary age. They too soon became Chinese, and the second ruler of the dynasty, Kang Shi, gave China the most prosperous, peaceful, and enlightened reign in the nation's history. Mounting the throne at the age of seven, Kang Shi took personal control at the age of thirteen of an empire that included not only China proper, but Mongolia, Manchuria, Korea, Indochina, Annam, Tibet, and Turkestan. It was without doubt the largest, richest, and most populous empire of its time. Kang Shi ruled it with a wisdom and justice that filled with envy the educated subjects of his contemporaries, Aurangzeb and Louis XIV. He was a man energetic in body and active in mind. He found health in a vigorous outdoor life, and at the same time labored to make himself acquainted with the learning and arts of his time. He traveled throughout his realm, corrected abuses wherever he saw them, and reformed the penal code. He lived frugally, cut down the expenses of administration, and took pride in the welfare of the people. Under his generous patronage and discriminating appreciation, literature and scholarship flourished, and the art of porcelain reached one of the peaks of its career. He tolerated all the religions, studied Latin under the Jesuits, and put up patiently with the strange practices of European merchants in his ports. When he died after a long and beneficent reign, 1661 to 1722, he left these as his parting words. There is cause for apprehension, lest in the centuries or millenniums to come, China may be endangered by collisions with the various nations of the West who come hither from beyond the seas. These problems, arising out of the increasing commerce and contacts of China with Europe, came to the front again under another able emperor of the Manchu line, Qian Lung. Qian Lung wrote 34,000 poems. One of them, on tea, came to the attention of Voltaire, who sent his compliments to the charming king of China. French missionaries painted his portrait and inscribed under it these indifferent verses. Occupé sans relâche à tous les soins divers d'un gouvernement qu'on admire, le plus grand potentat qui soit dans l'univers, et le meilleur lettré qui soit dans son empire. Occupied without rest in the diverse cares of a government which men admire, the greatest monarch in the world is also the most lettered man in his empire. He ruled China for two generations, 1736 to 1796, abdicated in his 85th year, and continued to dominate the government until his death in 1799. During the last years of his reign, an incident occurred which might have led the thoughtful to recall the forebodings of Kang Shi. England, which had aroused the emperor's anger by importing opium into China, sent in 1792 a commission under Lord McCartney to negotiate a commercial treaty with Qian Lung. The commissioners explained to him the advantages of trading with England, and added that the treaty which they sought would take for granted the equality of the British ruler with the Chinese emperor. Qian Lung dictated this reply to George III. I set no value on objects strange and ingenious, and have no use for your country's manufactures. This, then, is my answer to your request to appoint a representative at my court, a request contrary to our dynastic usage, which could only result in inconvenience to yourself. I have expounded my views in detail, and have commanded your tribute envoys to leave in peace on their homeward journeys. It behooves you, O king, to respect my sentiments and to display even greater devotion and loyalty in future, so that by perpetual submission to our throne you may secure peace and prosperity for your country hereafter. In these proud words China tried to stave off the Industrial Revolution. We shall see in the sequel how, nevertheless, that revolution came. Meanwhile, let us study the economic, political, and moral elements of the unique and instructive civilization which that revolution seems destined to destroy. 2. The People and Their Language The following description of Chinese society will apply chiefly to the nineteenth century. The changes brought on by contact with the West will be studied later. Every description must be taken with reserve, since a civilization is never quite the same over a long period of time or an extensive area of space. Population, appearance, dress, peculiarities of Chinese speech, of Chinese writing. The first element in the picture is number. There are many Chinese. 
Learned guessers calculate that the population of the Chinese states in 280 B.C. was around 14 million, in 200 A.D., 28 million, in 726, 41,500,000, in 1644, 89 million, in 1743, 150 million, in 1919, 330 million. In the 14th century, a European traveler counted in China 200 cities all greater than Venice. The Chinese census is obtained through a registration law requiring every household to inscribe the names of its occupants upon a tablet at the entrance. We do not know how accurate these tablets are or the reports which purport to be based upon them. It is probable that China now harbors some 400 million souls. The Chinese vary in stature, being shorter and weaker in the south, taller and stronger in the north. In general, they are the most vigorous people in Asia. They show great physical stamina, magnificent courage in the bearing of hardships and pain, exceptional resistance to disease, and a climatic adaptability which has enabled them to prosper in almost every zone. Neither opium nor inbreeding nor syphilis has been able to impair their health, and the collapse of their social system has not been due to any visible deterioration in their biological or mental vitality. The Chinese face is one of the most intelligent on earth, though not universally attractive. Some of the pauper class are incomparably ugly to our Western prejudice, and some criminals have an evil leer admirably suited to cinematic caricature. But the great majority have regular features, calm with the physiological accident of low eyelids and the social accumulation of centuries of civilization. The slant of the eyes is not so pronounced as one had been led to expect, and the yellow skin is often a pleasant suntanned brown. The women of the peasantry are almost as strong as the men. The ladies of the upper strata are delicate and pretty, starch themselves with powder, rouge their lips and cheeks, blacken their eyebrows, and train or thin them to resemble a willow leaf or the crescent moon. The hair in both sexes is coarse and vigorous, and never curls. The women wear theirs in a tuft, usually adorned with flowers. Under the last dynasty, the men, to please their rulers, adopted the Manchu custom of shaving the fore half of the head. In compensation, they left the remainder uncut and gathered it into a long queue, which became in time an instrument of correction and a support of pride. Beards were small and were always shaved, though seldom by the owners thereof. Barbers carried their shops about with them and throve. The head was ordinarily left bare. When men covered it, they used in winter a cap of velvet or fur with a turned-up rim, and in summer a conical cap of finely woven filaments of bamboo, surmounted in persons of any rank by a colored ball and a silken fringe. Women, when they could afford it, clothed their heads with silk or cotton bands adorned with tinsel, trinkets, or artificial flowers. Shoes were usually of warm cloth. Since the floor was often of cold tile or earth, the Chinese carried a miniature carpet with him under each foot. By a custom begun at the court of the Emperor Li Hao Chu, circa 970 A.D., the feet of girls at the age of seven were compressed with tight bandages to prevent their further growth, so that the mature lady might walk with a mincing step erotically pleasing to the men. It was regarded as immodest to speak of a woman's foot, and as scandalous to look at one. In the presence of a lady even the word for shoe was taboo. The practice spread to all ranks and groups except the Manchus and Tatars, and became so rigid that a deception about the size of the bride's foot sufficed to annul an engagement or a marriage. Kang Shi tried to stop the custom, but failed. Today it is one of the happier casualties of the revolution. Men covered their nakedness with trousers and tunics, almost always blue. In winter the trousers were overlaid with leggings, and additional tunics, sometimes to the number of thirteen, were put on. These were kept on night and day throughout the winter, and were removed one by one with the progress of spring. The tunic fell variously to the loins, or the knees, or the feet. It was buttoned closely up to the neck, and had immense sleeves instead of pockets. China does not say that a man pocketed an object, but that he sleeved it. Shirts and underwear were well-nigh unknown. In the country women wore trousers like the men, since they were accustomed to doing a man's work and more. In the towns they covered the trousers with skirts. In the cities silk was almost as common as cotton. No belt compressed the waist, and no corsets held in the breasts. In general the Chinese dress was more sensible, healthy, and convenient than the garb of the modern West. No tyranny of fashion harassed or exalted the life of the Chinese woman. All urban classes dressed alike, and nearly all generations. The quality of the garment might differ, but not the form, and all ranks might be sure that the fashion would last as long as the gown.
The language of the Chinese differed from the rest of the world even more distinctly than their dress. It had no alphabet, no spelling, no grammar, and no parts of speech. It is amazing how well and how long this oldest and most populous nation on earth has managed without these curses of Occidental youth. Perhaps in forgotten days there were inflections, declensions, conjugations, cases, numbers, tenses, moods, but the language as far back as we can trace it shows none of them. Every word in it may be a noun, a verb, an adjective, or an adverb, according to its context and its tone. Since the spoken dialects have only from four to eight hundred monosyllabic word sounds or vocables, and these must be used to express the forty thousand characters of the written language, each vocable has from four to nine tones, so that its meaning is made to differ according to the manner in which it is sung. Gestures and context eke out these tones, and make each sound serve many purposes. So the vocable e may mean any one of sixty-nine things, she may mean fifty-nine, ku twenty-nine. No other language has been at once so complex, so subtle, and so brief. The written language was even more unique than the spoken. The objects exhumed in Honan and tentatively dated back to the Shang dynasty bear writing in characters substantially like those in use until our own generation, so that, barring a few Copts who still speak ancient Egyptian, Chinese is both the oldest and the most widespread language spoken on the earth today. Originally, as we infer from a passage in Lao Tse, the Chinese used knotted cords to communicate messages. Probably the needs of priests in tracing magic formulas and of potters in marking their vessels led to the development of a pictorial script. These primitive pictograms were the original form of the six hundred signs that are now the fundamental characters in Chinese writing. Some two hundred and fourteen of them have been named radicals because they enter as elements into nearly all the characters of the current language. The present characters are highly complex symbols in which the primitive pictorial element has been overlaid with additions designed to define the term specifically, usually through some indication of its sound. Not only every word, but every idea has its own separate sign. One sign represents a horse, another sign a bay horse with a white belly, another a horse with a white spot on his forehead. Some of the characters are still relatively simple. A curve over a straight line, that is, the sun over the horizon, means morning. The sun and the moon together represent light. A mouth and a bird together means singing. A woman beneath a roof means peace. A woman, a mouth, and the sign for crooked constitute the character for dangerous. A man and a woman together mean talkative. Quarreling is a woman with two mouths. Wife is represented by signs for a woman, a broom, and a storm. From some points of view, this is a primitive language that has by supreme conservatism survived into modern times. Its difficulties are more obvious than its virtues. We are told that the Chinese takes from ten to fifty years to become acquainted with all the forty thousand characters in his language. But when we realize that these characters are not letters but ideas, and reflect on the length of time it would take us to master forty thousand ideas, or even a vocabulary of forty thousand words, we perceive that the terms of the comparison are unfair to the Chinese. What we should say is that it takes any one fifty years to master forty thousand ideas. In actual practice, the average Chinese gets along quite well with three or four thousand signs, and learns these readily enough by finding their radicals. The clearest advantage of such a language, expressing not sounds but ideas, is that it can be read by Koreans and Japanese as easily as by the Chinese, and provides the Far East with an international written language. Again, it unites in one system of writing all the inhabitants of China, whose dialects differ to the point of mutual unintelligibility. The same character is read as different sounds or words in different localities. This advantage applies in time as well as in space. Since the written language has remained essentially the same while the spoken language has diverged from it into a hundred dialects, the literature of China, written for two thousand years in these characters, can be read today by any literate Chinese, though we cannot tell how the ancient writers pronounced the words or spoke the ideas which the signs represent. This persistence of the same script amidst a flux and diversity of speech made for the preservation of Chinese thought and culture, and at the same time served as a powerful force for conservatism. Old ideas held the stage and formed the mind of youth. The character of Chinese civilization is symbolized in this phenomenon of its unique script, its unity amid diversity and growth, its profound conservatism, and its unrivaled continuity. This system of writing was in every sense a high intellectual achievement. 
It classified the whole world of objects, activities, and qualities under a few hundred root or radical signs, combined with these signs some fifteen hundred distinguishing marks, and made them represent in their completed forms all the ideas used in literature and life. We must not be too sure that our own diverse modes of writing down our thoughts are superior to this apparently primitive form. Leibniz in the seventeenth century and Sir Donald Ross in our time dreamed of a system of written signs independent of spoken languages, free from their nationalist diversity and their variations in space and time, and capable, therefore, of expressing the ideas of different peoples in identical and mutually intelligible ways. But precisely such a sign language, uniting a hundred generations and a quarter of the earth's inhabitants, already exists in the Far East. The conclusion of the Oriental is logical and terrible. The rest of the world must learn to write Chinese. 3. The Practical Life 1. In the Fields The poverty of the peasant, methods of husbandry, crops, tea, food, the stoicism of the village. All the varied literature of that language, all the subtleties of Chinese thought and the luxuries of Chinese life, rested in the last analysis on the fertility of the fields, or rather on the toil of men, for fertile fields are not born but made. Through many centuries the early inhabitants of China must have fought against jungle and forest, beast and insect, drought and flood, saltpeter and frost, to turn this vast wilderness into fruitful soil. And the victory had to be periodically rewon. A century of careless timber-cutting left a desert, and a few years of neglect allowed the jungle to return. The struggle was bitter and perilous. At any moment the barbarians might rush in and seize the slow growths of the cleared earth. Therefore the peasants, for their protection, lived not in isolated homesteads, but in small communities, surrounded their villages with walls, went out together to plant and cultivate the soil, and often slept through the night on guard in their fields. Their methods were simple and yet they did not differ much from what they are today. Sometimes they used plows, first of wood, then of stone, then of iron, but more often they turned up their little plots patiently with the hoe. They helped the soil with any natural fertilizer they could find, and did not disdain to collect for this purpose the offal of dogs and men. From the earliest times they dug innumerable canals to bring the water of their many rivers to rice paddies and millet fields. Deep channels were cut through miles of solid rock to tap some elusive stream, or to divert its course into a desiccated plain. Without rotation of crops or artificial manures, and often without draft animals of any kind, the Chinese have wrung two or three crops annually from at least half their soil, and have won more nourishment from the earth than any other people in history. The cereals they grew were chiefly millet and rice, with wheat and barley as lesser crops. The rice was turned into wine as well as food, but the peasant never drank too much of it. His favorite drink, and next to rice his largest crop, was tea. Used first as a medicine, it grew in popularity until, in the days of the Tongs, it entered the realms of export and poetry. By the fifteenth century all the Far East was aesthetically intoxicated with the ceremony of drinking tea. Epicures searched for new varieties, and drinking tournaments were held to determine whose tea was the best. Added to these products were delicious vegetables, sustaining legumes like the soybean and its sprouts, doughty condiments like garlic and the onion, and a thousand varieties of berries and fruits. Least of all products of rural toil was meat. Now and then oxen and buffaloes were used for plowing, but stock-raising for food was confined to pigs and fowl. A large part of the population lived by snaring fish from the streams and the sea. Dry rice, macaroni, vermicelli, a few vegetables and a little fish formed the diet of the poor. The well-to-do added pork and chicken, and the rich indulged a passion for duck. The most pretentious of Peking dinners consisted of a hundred courses of duck. Cow's milk was rare, and eggs were few and old, but the soybean provided wholesome milk and cheese. Cooking was developed into a fine art, and made use of everything. Grasses and seaweeds were plucked, and birds' nests ravished to make tasty soups. Dainty dishes were concocted out of shark's fins and fish intestines, locusts and grasshoppers, grubs and silkworms, horses and mules, rats and water snakes, cats and dogs. The Chinese loved to eat, and it was not unusual for a rich man's dinner to have forty courses, and to require three or four hours of gentlemanly absorption. The poor man did not need so much time for his two meals a day. With all his toil, the peasant, with exceptions here and there, was never secure from starvation until he was dead. The strong and clever accumulated large estates and concentrated the wealth of the country into a few hands. 
Occasionally, as under Shi Huang Ti, the soil was redivided among the population, but the natural inequality of men soon concentrated wealth again. The majority of the peasants owned land, but as the population increased faster than the area under cultivation, the average holding became smaller with every century. The result was a poverty equaled only by destitute India. The typical family earned but $83 a year, many men lived on two cents a day, and millions died of hunger in each year. For twenty centuries, China has had an average of one famine annually. Partly because the peasant was exploited to the verge of subsistence, partly because reproduction outran the fertility of the soil, and partly because transport was so undeveloped that one region might starve while another had more than it required. Finally, flood might destroy what the landlord and the tax collector had left. The Huang Ho, which the people called China's sorrow, might change its course, swamp a thousand villages, and leave another thousand with desiccated land. The peasants bore these evils with stolid fortitude. All that a man needs in this transitory life, said one of their proverbs, is a hat and a bowl of rice. They worked hard, but not fast. No complex machine hurried them or racked their nerves with its noise, its danger, and its speed. There were no weekends and no Sundays, but there were many holidays. Periodically some festival, like the Feast of the New Year or the Feast of the Lanterns, gave the worker some rest from his toil, and brightened with myth and drama the duller seasons of the year. When the winter turned away its scowling face and the snow-nourished earth softened under the spring rains, the peasants went out once more to plant their narrow fields and sang with good cheer the hopeful songs that had come down to them from the immemorial past. 2. In the Shops Handicrafts, silk, factories, guilds, men of burden, roads and canals, merchants, credit and coinage, currency experiments, printing press inflation. Meanwhile, industry flourished as nowhere else on earth before our eighteenth century. As far back as we can delve into Chinese history, we find busy handicrafts in the home and thriving trade in the towns. The basic industries were the weaving of textiles and the breeding of worms for the secretion of silk. Both were carried on by women in or near their cottages. Silk weaving was a very ancient art whose beginnings in China went back to the second millennium before Christ. The spinning of silk out of the cocoons of wild silkworms was known to the ancient classical world, but the breeding of the worms and the gathering and weaving of the silk as an industry were introduced into Europe from China by Nestorian monks about 552 A.D. The art was brought from Constantinople to Sicily in the 12th century and to England in the 15th. The Chinese fed the worms on fresh-cut mulberry leaves with startling results. On this diet, a pound of worms, approximately 700,000, increased in weight to 9,500 pounds in 42 days. The adult worms were then placed in little tents of straw, around which they wove their cocoons by emitting silk. The cocoons were dropped in hot water, the silk came away from its shell, was treated and woven, and was skillfully turned into a great variety of rich clothing, tapestries, embroideries, and brocades for the upper classes of the world. The razors and weavers of silk wore cotton. Even in the centuries before Christ, this domestic industry had been supplemented with shops in the towns. As far back as 300 B.C., there had been an urban proletariat organized with its masters into industrial guilds. The growth of this shop industry filled the towns with a busy population, making the China of Kublai Khan quite the equal, industrially, of 18th century Europe. There are a thousand workshops for each craft, wrote Marco Polo, and each furnishes employment for ten, fifteen, or twenty workmen, and in a few instances as many as forty. The opulent masters in these shops do not labor with their own hands, but on the contrary assume airs of gentility and affect parade. These guilds, like codified industries of our time, limited competition and regulated wages, prices, and hours. Many of them restricted output in order to maintain the prices of their products, and perhaps their genial content with traditional ways must share some of the responsibility for retarding the growth of science in China and obstructing the Industrial Revolution until all barriers and institutions are today being broken down by its flood. The guilds undertook many of the functions which the once proud citizens of the West have surrendered to the state. They passed their own laws and administered them fairly. They made strikes infrequent by arbitrating the disputes of employers and employees through mediation boards representing each side equally. 
They served in general as a self-governing and self-disciplining organization for industry and provided an admirable escape from the modern dilemma between laissez-faire and the servile state. These guilds were formed not only by merchants, manufacturers, and their workmen, but by such less exalted trades as barbers, coolies, and cooks. Even the beggars were united in a brotherhood that subjected its members to strict laws. A small minority of town laborers were slaves, engaged for the most part in domestic service, and usually bonded to their masters for a period of years or for life. In times of famine, girls and orphans were exposed for sale at the price of a few cash, and a father might at any time sell his daughters as bondservants. Such slavery, however, never reached the proportions that it attained in Greece and Rome. The majority of the workers were free agents or members of guilds, and the majority of the peasants owned their land and governed themselves in village communities largely independent of national control. The products of labor were carried on the backs of men. Even human transport moved, for the most part in sedan chairs raised upon the bruised but calloused shoulders of uncomplaining coolies. A word of Hindu origin, probably from the Tamil Kuli, K-U-L-I, hired servant. Heavy buckets or enormous bundles were balanced on the ends of poles and slung over the shoulder. Sometimes dray carts were drawn by donkeys, but more often they were pulled by men. Muscle was so cheap that there was no encouragement to the development of animal or mechanical transport, and the primitiveness of transportation offered no stimulus to the improvement of roads. When European capital built the first Chinese railway in 1876, a ten-mile line between Shanghai and Wusung, the people protested that it would disturb and defend the spirit of the earth, and the opposition grew so vigorous that the government bought the railroad and heaved its rolling stock into the sea. In the days of Shi Huang Ti and Kublai Khan, imperial highways existed, paved with stone, but only their outlines now remain. The city streets were mere alleys eight feet wide, designed with a view to keeping out the sun. Bridges were numerous and sometimes very beautiful, like the marble bridge at the Summer Palace. Commerce and travel used avenues of water almost as frequently as the land. Twenty-five thousand miles of canals served as a leisurely substitute for railways, and the Grand Canal between Hangzhou and Tianjin, 650 miles long, begun about 300 A.D. and completed by Kublai Khan, was surpassed only by the Great Wall in the modest list of China's engineering achievements. Junks and sampans plied the rivers busily and provided not only cheap transportation for goods but homes for millions of the poor. The Chinese are natural merchants and work many hours at the business of bargaining. Chinese philosophy and officialdom agreed in despising traders, and the Han emperors taxed them heavily and forbade them to use carriages or silk. The educated classes displayed long nails, as Western women wore French heels, to indicate their exemption from physical toil. It was the custom to rank scholars, teachers, and officials as the highest class, farmers as the next, artisans as the third, merchants as the lowest. For, said China, these last merely made profits by exchanging the fruits of other men's toil. Nevertheless, they prospered, carried the products of Chinese fields and workshops to all corners of Asia, and became in the end the chief financial support of the government. Internal commerce was hindered by the Likian tax, and foreign trade was made hazardous by robbers on land and pirates on the sea. But the merchants of China found a way, by sailing around the Malay Peninsula or plodding the caravan routes through Turkestan, to get their goods to India, Persia, Mesopotamia, at last even to Rome. Silk and tea, porcelain and paper, peaches and apricots, gunpowder and playing cards were the staple exports, in return for which the world sent to China alfalfa and glass, carrots and peanuts, tobacco and opium. Trade was facilitated by an ancient system of credit and coinage, Merchants lent to one another at high rates of interest, averaging some 36 percent, though this was no higher than in Greece and Rome. Moneylenders took great risks, charged commensurate fees, and were popular only at borrowing time. Wholesale robbers, said an old Chinese proverb, start a bank. The oldest known currency of the country took the form of shells, knives, and silk. The first metal currency went back at least to the 5th century B.C. Under the Qin dynasty, gold was made the standard of value by the government, but an alloy of copper and tin served for the smaller coins and gradually drove out the gold. Copper is still the dominant currency in the form of the cash, worth a third or a half of a cent, and the tail, which is worth a thousand cash. 
When Wu Ti's experiment with the currency of silver alloyed with tin was ruined by counterfeiters, the coins were replaced with leather strips a foot long, which became the foster parents of paper money. About the year 807, the supply of copper having, like modern gold, become inadequate as compared with the rising abundance of goods, the emperor Xian Sung ordered that all copper currency should be deposited with the government and issued in exchange for its certificates of indebtedness, which received the name of flying money from the Chinese, who appear to have taken their fiscal troubles as good-naturedly as the Americans of 1933. The practice was discontinued after the passing of the emergency, but the invention of block printing tempted the government to apply the new art to the making of money, and about 935 A.D. the semi-independent province of Sichuan, and in 970 the national government at Chang'an, began the issuance of paper money. During the Sung dynasty a fever of printing press inflation ruined many fortunes. The emperor's mint, wrote Polo of Kublai's treasury, is in the city of Kambaluk, Peking. And the way it is wrought is such that you might say that he hath the secret of alchemy in perfection, and you would be right, for he makes his money after this fashion. And he proceeded to arouse the incredulous scorn of his countrymen by describing the process by which the bark of the mulberry tree was pressed into bits of paper accepted by the people as the equivalent of gold. Such were the sources of that flood of paper money which ever since has alternately accelerated and threatened the economic life of the world. 3. Invention and science, gunpowder, fireworks and war, the compass, poverty of industrial invention, geography, mathematics, physics, feng shui, astronomy, medicine, hygiene. The Chinese have been more facile in making inventions than in using them. Gunpowder appeared under the tongs, but was very sensibly restricted to fireworks. Not until the Sung dynasty, in 1161 A.D., was it formed into hand grenades and employed in war. The Arabs became acquainted with saltpeter, the main constituent of gunpowder, in the course of their trade with China, and called it Chinese snow. They brought the secret of gunpowder westward, the Saracens turned it to military use, and Roger Bacon, the first European to mention it, may have learned of it through his study of Arab lore, or his acquaintance with the Central Asiatic traveller, de Rubruqui. The compass is of much greater antiquity. If we may believe Chinese historians, it was invented by the Duke of Zhou in the reign of the Emperor Cheng Wang, 1115-1078 B.C., to guide certain foreign ambassadors back to their homelands. The Duke, we are told, presented the embassy with five chariots, each equipped with a south-pointing needle. Very probably the magnetic properties of the lodestone were known to ancient China, but the use of it was confined to orienting temples. The magnetic needle was described in the Sung Shu an historical work of the 5th century A.D., and was attributed by the author to the astronomer Chang Heng, who died in 139 A.D., who, however, had only rediscovered what China had known before. The oldest mention of the needle as useful for mariners occurs in a work of the early 12th century, which ascribes this use of it to foreign, probably Arab, navigators plying between Sumatra and Canton. About 1190, we find the first known European notice of the compass in a poem by Guillaume de Provence. Despite the contribution of the compass and gunpowder, of paper and silk, of printing and porcelain, we cannot speak of the Chinese as an industrially inventive people. They were inventive in art, developing their own forms, and reaching a degree of sensitive perfection not surpassed in any other place or time. But before 1912, they were content with ancient economic ways, and had perhaps prophetic scorn of labor-saving devices that hectically accelerate the pace of human toil and throw half the population out of work in order to enrich the rest. They were among the first to use coal for fuel, and mined it in small quantities as early as 122 B.C., but they developed no mechanisms to ease the slavery of mining, and left for the most part unexplored the mineral resources of their soil. Though they knew how to make glass, they were satisfied to import it from the West. They made no watches or clocks or screws, and only the coarsest nails. Through the two thousand years that intervened between the rise of the Han and the fall of the Manchus, industrial life remained substantially the same in China, as it remained substantially the same in Europe, from Pericles to the Industrial Revolution. In like manner, China preferred the quiet and mannerly rule of tradition and scholarship to the exciting and disturbing growth of science and plutocracy. Of all the great civilizations, it has been the poorest in contributions to the material technique of life. It produced excellent textbooks of agriculture and sericulture two centuries before Christ, and excelled in treatises on geography. 
Its centenarian mathematician, Chang Tsang, who died in 152 B.C., left behind him a work on algebra and geometry containing the first known mention of a negative quantity. Tzu Chung Chi calculated the correct value of pi to six decimal places, improved the magnet or south-pointing vehicle, and is vaguely recorded to have experimented with a self-moving vessel. Chang Heng invented a seismograph in 132 A.D., but for the most part Chinese physics lost itself in the occultism of Feng Shui and the metaphysics of the Yang and the Yin. This seismograph consisted of eight copper dragons placed on delicate springs around a bowl in whose center squatted a toad with open mouth. Each dragon held a copper ball in its mouth. When an earthquake occurred, the dragon nearest its source dropped its ball into the mouth of the toad. Once a dragon released its ball, though no shock had been felt by the inhabitants. Chang Heng was ridiculed as a charlatan until a messenger arrived who told of an earthquake in a distant province. Feng Shui or wind and water, was the art, very widespread in China, of adapting the location of homes and graves to the currents of wind and water in the locality. Chinese mathematicians apparently derived algebra from India, but developed geometry for themselves out of their need for measuring the land. The astronomers of Confucius' time correctly calculated eclipses and laid the bases of the Chinese calendar, twelve hours a day and twelve months, each beginning with the new moon. An extra month was added periodically to bring this lunar calendar in accord with the seasons and the sun. Life on earth was lived in harmony with life in the sky. The festivals of the year were regulated by sun and moon. The moral order of society itself was based upon the regularity of the planets and the stars. Medicine in China was a characteristic mixture of empirical wisdom and popular superstition. It had its beginnings before recorded history and produced great physicians long before Hippocrates. Already under the Joes, the state held yearly examinations for admission to medical practice and fixed the salaries of the successful applicants according to their showing in the tests. In the fourth century before Christ, a Chinese governor ordered a careful dissection and anatomical study of forty beheaded criminals, but the results were lost in theoretical discussion and dissection stopped. Chang Chung Ning in the second century wrote treatises on dietetics and fevers, which remained standard texts for a thousand years. In the third century, Hua to wrote a volume on surgery and made operations popular by inventing a wine which produced a general anesthesia. It is one of the stupidities of history that the formula for mixing this drink has been lost. About 300 A.D., Wang Shu Ho wrote a celebrated treatise on the pulse. Towards the beginning of the sixth century, Tao Hung Ching composed an extensive description of the 730 drugs used in Chinese medicine. And a hundred years later, Chao Yuan Fang wrote a classic on the diseases of women and children. Medical encyclopedias were frequent under the Tongs, and specialist monographs under the Sungs. A medical college was established in the Sung dynasty, but most medical education was through apprenticeship. Drugs were abundant and various. One store, three centuries ago, sold a thousand dollars worth every day. Diagnosis was pedantically detailed. Ten thousand varieties of fever were described, and twenty-four conditions of the pulse were distinguished. Inoculation, not vaccination, was used, probably in imitation of India, in the treatment of smallpox, and mercury was administered for syphilis. This disease seems to have appeared in China in the later years of the Ming dynasty, to have run wild through the population, and to have left behind its course a comparative immunity to its more serious effects. Public sanitation, preventive medicine, hygiene, and surgery made little progress in China. Sewage and drainage systems were primitive or hardly existed. And some towns failed to solve the primary obligations of an organized society, to secure good water and to dispose of waste. Soap was a rare luxury, but lice and vermin were easily secured. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.